Um, I want to begin with just reading uh, a paragraph <clears throat> that I read last time, but I want to, I was in a little bit of a hurry last time, hoping to cover a little more ground and uh, maybe look at a couple of the scriptures that were in there. So uh, let us, even though we're in Romans, this, these, uh, the majority of the scriptures in this paragraph are in Romans, um, but I want to look in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, and 19. <clears throat> and I want to do that specifically because um, what we've been doing is we've been studying faith in relationship to the cross. And, but but the, you say a statement like that and people say, okay, faith in relationship to the cross is faith that Jesus died for my sins and I don't have to go to hell. Or Jesus died for my punishment so I don't have to be punished. Or, you know, all the, all the different things that we assume that faith in the cross relates to. But what we've been doing is we've been honing in on what we call the faith of Abraham or what the scriptures call the faith of Abraham and also what we call the faith. It is the faith. And that faith relates to that if there is a certain kind of death, if it is a selfless death, if it is in conjunction with the only selfless person that ever existed, <clears throat> which is Jesus, if it is in conjunction with his cross, uh, whether that be us crucified with Christ or that be um, um, us bearing about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus, or that be uh, some other form of, of um, well, I'll, I'll qualify this in just a second, some other form of death, um, then there's life out of that death. But there's not life out of just giving yourself um, outside of the realm of what I've called the coin in other classes. That there's not, you're, you're not just um, giving yourself, someone else is benefiting at your expense. And a lot of times people are not open to that particular kind of death. You know? <laughs> I've got a problem with that one. Um, so we've been, we've been discussing that, and I'll get into that a little more clearly, but we're in 1 Corinthians 15, um, and this whole chapter basically is dealing with life out of death. Um, so uh, I mentioned uh, verse 17 and then verse 19, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is in, in vain, you're yet in your sins, which means that if there, if there is a death, if Christ died and he's not raised, then this, this faith is ridiculous. And here's the deal behind that. It's not just that if he died and God doesn't raise him up, then, oh man, that's bad. That's what we think it means. No, what it means is that if Christ died the right kind of death and there's no resurrection out of this, then what's the point of faith? Because faith, the faith of Abraham believes in life out of death, believes that. It doesn't just believe that um, if anyone dies, even as a Christian, there's going to be a resurrection. And he's explaining that in his 15th chapter. And then you see that um, borne out a little more in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, meaning that um, uh, if there is no ultimate, um, and, and I want to be real careful here, we think resurrection is a reward for death, and it's not. It's a result of death. And the thing that is honored in God's eyes is the death, not the resurrection. And that's a tough one because people don't, they can't wrap their minds around that. They're not used to it. They're not, they, they don't think that way. God thinks that way. And the proof of that is, let's just, uh, and then let's look at verse 36. Um, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not made alive except it die. Okay, so there it is. It's stated straight up. 
that li this is about life out of death. It is stating right there, except the only thing that's added to that is, you fool, you don't get it. <laughs> well, that's all, that, you know, it says what? You don't, you don't understand this? You know, didn't Jesus say, call no man a fool? So what is that going to happen to Paul? Forever consigned to the pit. No, there is, uh, in fact, you'll find Jesus calling someone a fool. So if you check that one out, it is not, it is a derogatory statement that is done, serves no purpose but to hurt someone else or to lift you up. That is not honorable. On the other hand, if it is a situation where you're ignorant of the faith, you're ignorant of life out of death, thou fool, don't you know that? what you sow into death, life is going to come out of that if it's the right kind of death. So there's that. So, if Christ was not raised, then your faith is in vain. So I'm going to read this paragraph, and like I said, we did cover some of this. Why did the scriptures declare this? If Christ is not raised, then your faith is in vain. Because this faith, this kind of faith, this faith spoken of in these verses is specifically a faith that believes in life out of death, but not just in some future one-time heavenly action carried out by Jesus 2,000 years ago, but as a principle of the way of God himself. Anybody remember us discussing that reality, the way of God himself? Okay. Well, I hope, I hope you do, because if you don't, <clears throat> If you don't, then your, your justification is not full, is not filled full. Because he's, it goes on to say that justify, if you're justified by this same self-giving way, by the nature of God, then you're going to live by that. The just shall live by this same principle. Okay, that's, that's solid. Man, that's solid. That's in a bunch of different books of the New Testament. That one verse quoted over and over. And so, um, you know, there has to come, there has to come like a, I don't know, a break with our old gravitational pulls. Uh, our first gravitational pull is around us in this life. And so we're kind of like a moon that's caught in the Earth's gravitation, and everything circulates around our life in this Earth. And so we're going around and around in it, and we're pointing in it, and and we're uh, pulled and kept and focused by you're saved. You know, you're saved in this Earth. You're saved. You can live saved, which it doesn't say. It says the just shall live by faith, which is not the kind of faith most people think. So you're, but then one day by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are literally, your, your, your gravitation has changed. And it's like you become, a, I'll put it on this basis, a, a planet around the sun. And so now the sun is the focus of everything. And now you're, you're no longer centered on your life in the earth, even if it's your salvation and, you know, what God will do, he'll heal you down here and he'll do this down here and he'll do that. That's fine. He'll do that. But that's not where your focus is. Your focus is on the sun now. And now you're caught in that. And that's, that's, a, that's a radical change of being. I'm talking about literally when you say, I remember about the time when God began to change my gravitational pull. I remember when there was a shift in everything related to my focus. And all of a sudden, Christ began to be that, not, not the Christ of the earth, not Jesus of Nazareth, not the Christ of the earth, of, of, of how Jesus of Nazareth walked on the earth, but the one that's raised up, the one that is outside of this realm now. And now he's seated there, and we're supposed to be seated in him, and we're supposed to be a partaker of the divine nature. Well, that, that, that's a radical break 
with your life and the, and the earth and with the way you view things and with things that are important and everything, everything begins to change. And now all of a sudden, things that are outside the earth, things where Christ is seated, set your affections on things above, the sun. And so that's where I was going with the gravitational thing because that gravitational thing is like a, it, it, it holds you, it holds you. And you can try to break with it or, or you can be kind of like the moon and go, okay, well, you know, this, I'm, I'm, I'm facing toward the sun now, even as the earth pulls you around behind it. Now you can't see the sun at all. So you go through your ups and downs. So I'm with Jesus, I'm not with Jesus, I'm with Jesus, I'm not with Jesus. Whereas the other is, this is, you know, this is it. This is what holds me. This is where my focus is. This is what has me. And more importantly, him, the son, is what has my attention. And see, you can't even use that word. He has my attention because everybody has a, a ten, poor attention spans. Okay. So, yeah, he's got my attention for right now. He's got my attention while I'm in church. He's got my attention when I'm on an outreach. He's got my attention when something spiritual is going on. But when not, you know, when I'm just when I'm just in the earth, family work, this or that, I'm stuck. Well, there is no, to my knowledge. Of course, I don't know the whole universe. I know most of it, but I, that's a joke. <laughs> But to my knowledge, there is, there is no moon that is stuck in the gravitational pull around a planet that itself also swings out and then swings around its sun in its solar system and then swings back around the... That's us. That's not according to the way God set it up. But that's us. We're sometimes in the gravitational pull of the sun and we're sometimes in the gravitational pull of the earth. And that's wrong. And that's that... that the only reason why that is is because the sun that we think we're in his gravitational pull is just a, an attention, a change of attention for a while, a change of focus. We're still bound by the earth. You can't break, you cannot change gravity. I don't know what you know about physics, but gravity is one of the most powerful forces in all of the universe. It controls major stuff that you can't even imagine. Black holes. The heart and soul of a black hole is the gravitational pull. Okay, so, you know, we don't realize it because we go, well, you know, Newton, you know, threw an apple up and it came down and hit him on the head and he went, hmm. Things go up, they come down, you know. Uh, it, it's a lot more powerful than that. It is, if you're in that gravity, that's you. That's who you are. Until there's, until there's a break with that gravity. Until you grow up and quit being a moon, start becoming, yeah, as it were, the way, the way we're using it tonight, a planet that is in his gravitational pull with everything s centered on the sun himself, Jesus. And so, geez, I'm not even getting out of the paragraph I let, read last week. Um, <clears throat> Because this faith spoken of in these verses is specifically a faith that believes in life out of death, but not just in some future one-time heavenly action carried out by Jesus 2,000 years ago, but as a principle of the way of God, the way of God, the way of God, the nature of God, the divine nature, the selfless giving. Uh, this means that in Paul's understanding, the death of Christ without being followed up with resurrection would be impossible. If Christ were not raised, then your faith is in vain. That's impossible. It's impossible to this faith, this way that God lives. Okay? If there is this kind of death, Jesus knew that, and he went into a selfless death knowing that the way that the nature of God works, he's going to be raised up out of it. Okay? This, uh, let's see, let's... God's economy or principles by which he functions his nature, whether it involve Christ or us, is always based on a death life experience. Hence, we come away with the common phrase, resurrection from the dead. Romans 1, 4. 
resurrection from the dead. Okay, so, so check it out in the first beginning of, a, of many of the chapters in the New Testament, the epistles. You'll, you'll begin to see this phraseology, the res, by the re, this was done by the resurrection from the dead. This was done by the resurrection, okay? And in it, there is the faith that he's trying to, I'm trying to communicate to you not just the faith that you should live by, but the nature of God and that ultimately you must, you, the justified, must live by this same faith. The one that saved you is going to be the one that God uses you for to save others, not by witnessing door to door or, you know, being a good Christian at work or da 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 da. No, by by Christ and Him crucified, by this nature at work within us. We're, I'm jumping ahead here, but anyway, resurrection is always qualified by death. Romans 10.9 substantiates this with, if you, if you believe that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you believe in this nature, this principle, you, then you know you're going to be saved. You, you, you have, that's called assurance of faith. But it's not assurance of faith. It's faith has assurance in God's nature and in this, this reality, this economy of God's nature. Um, you shall be saved because it is a faith in the ongoing principle of the function of divine nature. Therefore, it is not just faith in the one-time act that defines the true faith that God wants, that he wants us to have. God calls it not the act of faith, but the word of faith, as in Romans 10.8. This word of faith is not confined to a past event but is near you now in your heart and in your mouth. In other words, this principle of life out of a certain kind of death is not merely believed upon as one looks back to the crucifixion long ago. Instead, we have it at work on the inside of us based on an act of faith in the way and the nature of God. All right. So we're going to, that's what we're going to start developing now. It's the statements have been made. We want to start developing this. My subtitle here is called Faith in Death, and then in parentheses where I have death, because we're, we're talking about life out of death, I put selfless giving. Faith in death, selfless giving, as God's chosen method. In initial faith, we're confronted with the reality that we're guilty of sin and that we cannot save ourselves. Okay. In other words, like Abraham, we become cognizant of our deadness, of our inability. Once that's recognized, then our faith latches onto Christ crucified at the cross as our hope. So you see a little picture of that with Abraham taking Isaac up on Mount Moriah, and God says, offer up your son, your only son, whom thou lovest. And so he's getting ready to do it, but this isn't, the, this isn't the real son. This isn't the one that has this nature. He doesn't know for sure what's going on. This Isaac doesn't know for sure what's going on. So God spares him and puts a ram in the thicket and says, there, the, you know, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And that ram represents Christ, and it represents his death, not your death, and that you should have died, Isaac. But instead of me taking your son, your only son whom thou lovest, I'm going to give you my, I'm going to give up my son, my only son whom I love. Okay. So there's the God's giving nature right there. You see it in the father, you see it in the son, you see it in both. In the picture of Abraham and Isaac, you see it strongest in the father. Why? Because God is love. This operation of selfless giving one to another. The Holy Spirit will not declare himself. Jesus will not declare himself. The Father says, this is my beloved Son. The Holy Spirit says, I will, I will declare him. It is always and forever a foreign economy, a foreign nature to everything that we are 
and you can fake it for a while, but if you fake it, you won't make it. And now I'm a rapper. Anyway, so keep that in mind that, you know, you can, you and me, we can go along for a long time just going through the motions of this, thinking that we're, we've latched on to something that's really the truth, when in reality, we still are full of self-centered motivations, okay? We say, yeah, but I'm doing this for someone else, okay? Well, you know, come on, slap yourself in the face and say, I'm going to dig a little deeper, buddy, and just check to see if there are some other things at work here, too. Are you going to get anything out of it? And if, if secretly that was your deepest motive or that was your motive and you're hiding it, you, you're not hiding it from God. You're hiding it from yourself. I've said it many times, the Bible talks more about self-deception than the devil deceiving us. Okay, so, so how does self-deception happen? It happens when, we, when pride and self wants to be something that it can't be except by Christ. And it wants a certain regard from people. And I don't want to look bad. Well, you already look bad to God. The only person you look good to is people of the earth that their opinion shouldn't matter. The only person you look bad to is God, whose opinion I would think would be important, especially down the road. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, well, I, I, it's better that I deceive myself. It's better than I say, oh, I'm okay, or this not, it's not that bad, or I'm not, you know, whatever, whatever junk we go through, we all go through something similar. And it is, it is nothing more than seeking to obtain a status that we could only have by Christ, but we're, trying, we're going in through another door. We're entering in through another door. And we're, we're okay to do it because we see the results in the flesh. We see the results with, with people that don't have enough discernment to see past the end of their nose. So they don't know. They, they will go, they'll, they'll think you're spiritual. You know? And they'll go, oh, they'll, you know, they'll anoint you and this and that and whatever else. And they'll, you know, say great things about you and everything. And you'll just smile even if it's only on the inside when you hear it and stuff. And God will just go, this whole thing's an abomination to me. It's an abomination. Okay. Well, self-deception won't allow you to see that. You know, see that to God it's an abomination. Self-deception will not allow you to look this in the face. Only by the Spirit of God, usually used in a huge crisis. Amen? Most of us know the value of crisis. Crisis. That's when God can do his best work. He will shake me, you, uh, anybody. He don't, you know, he don't, he doesn't care who he has to shake. Yeah, yeah, he's no respecter of persons. So, you know, somebody said, yeah, God's got my number. I got news for you. He ain't just calling. He's going to slam into you. <laughs> you know, he's not going to use the phone or text you. He's going to show up at your door. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, um, once that is recognized, then our faith latches onto Christ crucified at the cross as our hope, because what? Oh, I can't do this. I mean, that's how you got saved, was you said, I can't do this. Okay, but guess what? That, you're supposed to live by that. I can't do it, but he can. Amen? Okay, so... Um, so in that early stage, at that point, we believe in and receive the benefits of life out of death, but it's his death, you know. We, we acknowledge that cross, and I guess I should have put, do you know, anybody know what number this class is? I don't. Woo! Okay, so that 
that cross that is his, that cross that is his, oh yeah, I will honor the fool out of that. We think that that makes us spiritual. But we're just honoring something that's benefiting us and we're not honoring the principle or the, the core or the nature of it. We're just going, oh look, it'd be like, it'd be like if this cross I've drawn on the chalkboard here was a tree. Oh yeah, the cross is a tree. But we make it a Christmas tree. And underneath it are all the benefits and presents that we get from Jesus because of this wonderful tree. But we never partake of the tree, we only partake of the presents. I wrote it, not really, I'm, I'm teasing. Okay. All right, so in, the, in this picture of Christ crucified on the cross, we, we, we must eventually look past me. We must look for him. And as we look for him, we, you know, if you seek him, you'll find him. Anybody believe that? Yes. Hey Amen. Do you believe it? If you seek him, you will find him. But if you seek him for five minutes, you'll get five minutes worth. How long, how, how good is that going to do you? But if you give your heart to Jesus, guess what he's going to do? He's going to give his heart back to you. He'll, he'll give himself because he's self-giving. Amen? All right. So there has to be this thing. And that's what will... That's what will enlighten your eyes, therefore, to the faith, because now you'll have faith in him, not just his work on the cross, but the self-giving nature that took him to the two pieces of wood called the cross. This is the drawing of the Holy Spirit. This is the deepest desire of the Holy Spirit, and if you, if you if you'll give him half a chance, oh my God, people, he will, he will just, he'll open all, you know, he'll open the Holy of Holies for you. And you say, what's well, already open? Well, yeah, apparently, but you know, again, it's like going in there and then we don't see what's on the throne. We don't see a lamb on the throne. We see the gifts and then we run out of there. All right, so. At, at this point, we believe in and receive the benefits of life out of death, his death. This is the early stage of faith that will eventually lead to the faith of the Son of God, as spoken of in Galatians 2.20. So let's just take a quick glance at Galatians 2.20. You say, oh, I know that scripture. Uh, yeah, hold on there, Skippy. You may not know it as much as you think. I know I don't. I'm constantly amazed at the Holy Spirit at how he can just keep showing you more and more depths of Christ. All right, well, we all know the first part, so let's go to the second part of Galatians 2.20. And the life, the life which I now live. What is he talking about? The life which he now lives. Is that right? Am I, is that what he's talking about? He's talking about a life that he lives, but he's talking about living that in the flesh, not someday in the future. The life I now live in the flesh. The life that I now live, well, what do you suppose that is? What do you suppose the life that he's talking about that he now lives? Anybody have a clue? Pardon? Well, yeah, the, the life that he lives in the flesh, but what is the life that he's living? Well, it's I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but what, what he's already said. So it's, a, it's founded on, everything's founded on this death that Jesus did and that he did. So he says, the, now the life that I live in my flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Okay? I live by the faith of the Son of God. I don't live by my faith now. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me by giving himself for me. It's one translation. Who loved me by giving himself. I live by the, his faith. 
that loves by giving itself for people. And he, he proves that by saying, he gave himself for me. He died that I would have life. Amen? He died that I may have life. And so I got it. I got it. That's his nature and his way, and I'm going to live by that. I'm going to live by that, and I'm going to die that he might live. Same principle. You see it? It's the same principle. Now, though he was justified at first, now he sees what was the basis of his justification, and now he lives by that faith. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gives himself, who, who loves by giving himself for me. Okay. It is a love that is defined by giving itself. It's a love defined by giving itself. Now, I've heard people say, well, you know, it's kind of like a mother's love. Well, you know, I really don't have enough people mad at me. So I'm going to address this. No, I don't. You know, the, I've been working my way through the list, and it's getting a little short, and I need to add some people now. Uh, I need to get mothers up in arms against me. But let me tell you something. A lot of mothers love for, the, for what they feel out of it. Oh, I feel so good, you know. I, I, I have children and they love me and they need me. They need me and they love me and they, you know. And that's why in latter years when they don't do what you think they ought to do, the moms get upset with them. It's like, what are you doing, what? you know? Uh, my, my mom's favorite, I love my mother, but you know, she passed away years ago, but she, her, um, her line would be, um, what was it? It was, it was always along the line of, of um, oh yeah, I, I gave you life. I birthed you, you know. And I, I, I always mess with my mom, love messing with her. We had a great relationship. And I'd say, yeah, mom, but what have you done for me lately? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'll never forget, she broke out laughing and said, Randy, I'll dance on your grave one day, which means, you know, I'll be happy that you're dead, and I'll dance on your grave. And I said, good, Mom, I'm going to be buried at sea, you know. <laughs> and we'd laugh and we'd carry on. I miss my mom. But anyway, uh, but, you know, these things come up, you know, well, you know, I, I gave you life, I birthed you. Do you know the pain I went through or what? I don't even know all of this stuff. Well, you don't bring up all of that stuff if it's mother's love is agape. You see what I'm saying? Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs, you know. Love suffereth long. Love is kind. Love is not puffed up. Love does not easily hurt feelings. Offended, same thing. A lot of times we're offended because we got hurt feelings. Well, I'm offended. <laughs> you know, shut up and get on the cross. Aren't y'all glad I'm your pastor? <laughs> Or are you? Did I just add you to my list? <laughs> All right. So it is a love that is defined by giving itself. Okay, so giving itself, I'm, I've got that in parentheses. Giving itself is not confined to death. Giving itself is not confined to death, but includes suffering, loss, or any act that is done selflessly within the realm of what we term the cross. Okay, so Romans 8, 17 says, if we, uh, you know, if we suffer with him, we'll be glorified with him. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 12 says that 
If you suffer with him, you'll reign. If you die with him, you'll be raised. Okay, so those verses are showing you that life out of death is not the best definition of the faith in this sense. It is selfless giving. Life comes out of selfless giving either all the way to death or suffering or loss. You, if you lose, then you gain. What? You have to lose in the right way. See? And there's nothing on this earth says where if you lose, you're going to gain. Everybody is working to gain and make everybody else lose. That's the way of the world. You know, it's a rat race. The rat race. I choose not to be in it. <laughs> All right, so let me just let me just hammer this in. When we say life out of death, we're not saying literally that you have to die on the cross. We're saying that you may suffer loss, you may suffer by Christ. You know, we, we assume that to suffer means that, you know, you're going to have hurt feelings and you're going to be, you know, you're going to have things that you can't get over. And, you know, I, you know, I was betrayed, you know. I mean, when Judas walked up to betray Jesus in the garden, Jesus, you know, Judas gave him a kiss. Jesus didn't go, get off of me, sucker. You know, he didn't say, get away from, you know, you, you traitor, you know, and rail on him. And he says, friend, betrayest thou me with a kiss? It didn't sound like somebody wounded and, oh, my God, I did everything for you. There's another mother's love thing. <laughs> I did everything for you, you know. Jesus did. But guess what? Here's a good point. Jesus knew his purpose, but here's the thing. He didn't do it because he knew his purpose. He did it because he knew his nature. We say, well, Jesus knew his purpose, so he put up with this. But I don't see it in this situation with someone. It, for Jesus, it wasn't a situation of God's purpose. It was a situation of his nature. He knew beforehand, yes, but he didn't know the purpose. I'm going to say it like this. He didn't know it as his purpose beforehand. He knew it as his nature. The, the determinant counsel of God, as it describes in Acts chapter 2, said this is the way we're determined. This is the way we are, we are self-determined. We're self-giving. This is what we do. Jesus said, I'll do it. You know, in relationship to the cross, the Holy Spirit says, well, I'll, I'll go down and put up with those people for thousands and thousands of years without them really seeking the Lord or doing anything and, you know, selfless giving. Father says, I'll give my son selfless giving. He who spared not his son but gave him freely for all of us. So... So there's this thing in our head. We say, well, he was the son of God, and God got together before the foundation of the world, and they said, you know, hey, let's, let's let it go bad. Yeah, let's let it go bad. And then let's do something good. And, oh, my God. And so... What am I saying to you by saying what I've just said? I'm saying you do not have to recognize every situation as the God-ordained cross moment. You are supposed to live by a nature that'll just do those things. See? But for some reason, folks,
for some reason, oh, if I could just see Jesus in this, well, you're, are you being crucified? Yes. <laughs> well, we'd like to see Jesus in it too. <laughs> I hope he shows up in you. You know, yes. I think that um, this is a person there's so much to know, and I know I just ventured a few steps in this area, but something I've noticed is there have been times when I gave my life and I didn't really realize it's what I had done. Like Jesus just did it, but I was looking for, I need to be aware, so I can engage my will and say, yes, I will give my life. Like I'm contriving the situation, and I think that that's the life of Jesus. But if he's just living, I can just trust that he's going to give his life at the right time. And I don't even have to know the situation that I'm giving. That, you know, it'll just, it, a lot of times it'll just happen, and it's just his life, we just got to trust that life. Well, and I think that's right because things that happen by nature, you don't always know. But I'll, I'm going to be honest with you. In my, in my life, and I'll tell you, you remember, you remember that for the most part of the year so far, I have been dealing with just amazing outside pretty much problems and junk. Y'all remember that? They continue. Even, even now with brand new, amazingly big, huge stuff is still going on. Uh, in the midst of wanting to hear from the word, the Lord and the word and, you know, and, and everything. And of course he's not going to change, you know, we want to just seclude off and then, you know, not be disturbed. You know, we're still going to have outreaches. We're still going to, I know I'm still going to constantly be in the middle of stuff for this year, right in the middle of all this. And, you know, if you want to pray for anything with me, God, just pray that I can, my body can relax. I can just let down some because it's so, so tight. And I just lay there at night and wake up all through the night. And Anyway, um, so back to what Mallory said about, you know, sometimes we don't know it, and I agree with that. But I, I, in my situation, not that my situation is to be yours, but I am able to recognize for the most part things as opportunities for the cross based on this simple formula. Number one, when something negative happens, remember I wrote some things on the board, don't be hasty, da 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 da, some of you remember any of that. <clears throat> uh, I, I, first of all, I back off and I say, okay, you know, what's the deal here? Because as pastor, see, as a, as a son of God, I may be required to lay down my life. But as a pastor, I may be required to do something different. So I have to really hear, not just hear, but hear maybe from several different angles. All right. So, so I, it's just in, it's in God's best interest, your best interest, mine, that I step back, first of all, and I just, you know, check in with the Lord and say, okay, what's, what's the deal? But usually when I do that, it gives me just enough time to look at it and, and, take, and look at it as a son of God first and say, okay, um, this, in many, in, you know, in many cases is unwarranted, is an unwarranted attack on me. Let's just say it like that. Because Peter talks about that. He says, well, if, you, if you've done something and you deserve it, you, you know, and you faithful you, you you patiently take it no nope. what's the big deal there's no reward for that you you brought this on your own head dummy that's why he talks to me because he's seen me um and he so you know part of it is to evaluate hey did i cause some of this even even some see i don't go did i cause this i say, is there any part that i'm guilty in this okay but then if, if you see particularly that there's some part or the whole thing is just an attack or whatever or, or just somebody's upset or whatever, I just look at it and go, praise God, this is a good opportunity to lay down my life. I'm just being honest with you. A lot of times it doesn't take that much time for me. It's just like, okay, I know what to do. I know exactly what to do. This is it. You know, we say, this is the moment for which I came. But this is only one moment in a million, sometimes hundreds in a day. You know, we don't, I don't know that we evaluate our motives that often. But we make 
we make hundreds of decisions every day, thought decisions or da 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 da, and, and we make all these things. And you know, how can we be how can we be accountable for them when we don't even realize we're doing that all the time? You know, and how if we're not, how can God hold us accountable when we don't keep track of our junk? so that he can point it out and say, you remember that thought that you had? No, I don't remember that. I conveniently forget those kind of things when I, you know, get, you know, when it's uncomfortable, I uh, am not aware of that and therefore I am not guilty because, uh, you know, I, you have to be aware of it. And God goes, no, you're a slimy dog. <laughs> well, that's how he talks to me again. You're going, what kind of God do you have? He's my father and he loves me and he talks straight up to me and I like it. And I don't want it to change. You know. Uh, Jim, you remember in that, uh, in Ireland and Scott, when that first session, I think it was, or one of the first sessions when I was going to share, and this wasn't even on the uh, bride sessions, but this was one of the other ones um, that I, I, Literally to all these pastors from and people, leaders from all other countries too, I told them my value in being wounded like Jacob and walking with a limp, the value that I have of not thinking more highly of myself than I ought, of, of actually carrying junk and limps and this and that. And I explained to those men, mainly, I mean to everyone, how precious that was to me. How precious that was to me. If you ever get a chance to listen to it, it'd probably do you good because then you might understand something about me that um, why I'm not so quick to get rid of stuff that, you know, frankly, that keeps me down. You know what I mean? God sent the man who had revelations upon revelations, was caught up to the third heaven. He sent him a, a demon to buffet him in the flesh. And you know what Paul said about it? He said, you know, I prayed, get rid of it, man. Get rid of it. It's a devil. He said, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. I'll cover you with my grace, not with your strength. You, you know, you don't need grace when you, you got plenty of strength and can handle everything. Right? But I mean, Paul says, therefore, I will most gladly, I, I take these things and I let them do whatever they're going to do to me, beat me down at times and, or, or, or mess with me, but it always brings me to a place where I find the Lord. See, I don't recommend it for everybody. Everybody just get free. Don't worry about it. But I'm telling you, with, in my situation, I mean, uh, seriously, some of you wonder. I know you have. Well, Randy's weird. Why didn't he do this? Or da-da-da-da. Or why would he say that? Or da-da-da-da. I think if you'd listen to that one, I think you'd have a little more insight into who I am and why I am the way I am why I'm not so quick for me. I'll pray for you in a heartbeat. But I check th certain things with me and I go, you know what? If I got that removed, what kind of junk would be released? You say, well, shouldn't that all be dead? Yeah, but shouldn't it have been dead in Paul when he had abundance of revelation? And God still having to use something like that? So, so I'll just, I'll just say I'm, I'm, too weak and messed up to be able to walk above everything completely the way you are. So I, I give thanks for my buffetings and for my afflictions and for my lack of whatever, confidence or anything like that. I'll find it in my Jesus. Anyway. Um, so Jesus, this is the subtitle here. Jesus' act of death was based on his faith. Do you all agree with that statement? Do you understand it? Jesus' act of death, of going to that cross, was based on his faith. And what was the faith again? 
one of loving by giving yourself. That's his faith. Okay. Um, let's look in Romans 3. Romans chapter 3. I hope I got the right verse here. Romans 3, 3 says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the... Now, my Schofield changes the word faith to faithfulness of God without effect. But listen to it if you literally take it. It's amazing scripture because it's really talking about faith and your ours and his and whatever. For what if thou... What if some did not believe? Okay, what if they didn't believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. God, it's not possible. God still believes in this method. God believes that if you want to get high, get low. If you want to gain, lose. So you see, when we say life out of death, do you, are you beginning to change that now into the concept of selfless giving? Life comes out of selfless giving on whatever form. Losing, getting low, da 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 da. And usually the, it redounds to others, but certainly it has an effect back on us too. All right. And uh, so, so, what is the faith of the Son of God? In Galatians 2 20, the apostle begins to give us his definition of what it means to live by faith. He uses the words, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. Clearly, living a life of faith on this earth is his intended meaning of this passage. He's talking about how he lives or his walk of faith or how he lives by faith. All right. First, let us notice what kind of faith he is referring to. As explained in the next few words, I live by the faith of the Son of God. This is Paul's definition of what it means to live by faith. If this is referring to Jesus functioning by a specific faith, it would mean that God holds something sacred. Okay, now I'm just I'm building here. Just let me build. Don't grab that statement. If this is referring to Jesus, Jesus functioning by a specific faith, it would mean that God holds something sacred. Okay, well, he does, and I'll explain that. He, he holds nature above commandment. But to speak of faith or the faith of Christ, it must be tied to the cross or at least the subject of our crucifixion. In other words, there is no selfless giving that doesn't come from Jesus. Either him or him in us. There is no, there's no such thing. You say, well, what about the monks? What about the Buddhist monks? <laughs> what about them? You know? And is it possible to live selflessly on this earth apart from Christ? Like, go, you know, be a Buddhist monk or something? No. The Adamic nature won't allow for that. Well, you'd be surprised what goes on in those places. You can find Adam long enough and something's going to explode. You know what I mean? That's why they have him up on the mountaintop so nobody can see any, what happens. <laughs> I'm just too, I don't know. What am I saying? Don't listen to me. <laughs> um, the Lord believed in life out of death, else he would not have gone to the cross. Y'all have already in another class said y'all agree with that. He believed in life out of death or he wouldn't have gone to the cross. Okay. Because Jesus believed in life out of death, his death was synonymous with his faith. And Philippians 2, 5 through 11 explain that, that he understood and therefore he got lower and lower and lower believing that he, by this nature, if he gave, God the Father would raise him. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And so he, he's getting lower and lower and lower. And then wherefore, because he got lower and lower and lower, and it doesn't mention salvation in Philippians 2 there. It's just the act of self-giving. 
he got lower and lower. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name because he went to the extreme of selfless giving. So there was a resurrection. There was an ascension. Okay? This means that likewise our faith must be strategically tied to the cross of our own crucifixion. And that's Philippians 3, 10 through 11. And you can check that out. And that's Paul's prayer. His prayer is that, um, you know, I want to know you. I want to know you. Okay, well, where are you going to know Jesus at? Walk in the streets of Nazareth. No. Walk in the streets and healing people in Jerusalem. No. Where are you going to know him at? Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, not your resurrection, not resurrection power, in the power of his resurrection being made conformable to his death. See, he's wanting to know a power that can only come by him being conformed to a death. He want, he's looking for a power of resurrection, which is, so he's not saying, I want to be made conformable to his resurrection. He didn't say that. He said, I want to know that power by being made conformable to his death. Check it out. That's the basis that he wants, you know. The only reason why he would know the power of his death is that he wants to first be conformed to the, his death. The power of his resurrection is he wants to be conformed to his death. The power of his resurrection is automatic if you're conformed to his death. Whether that be suffering with him, then you be glorified with him, or if you lose, he'll see to it that you gain. But if you lose to gain, you've already lost and you're just, just going to lose. You know, I knew a guy, I knew a guy, he was a part of this church. Went to Las Vegas, and he kept pumping money into the into the card game. He kept believing that God was going to, you know, because he was going to use that money for something for God. So he said, so I'm going to go to Vegas, I'm going to win a bunch of money, I'm going to use it for God. And he lost all of his money. Because he kept thinking, his faith was, I'm going to gain. Even if I give it to someone else, I'm going to gain. Wrong motive. Can't be that. Can't be that. It has to be I willingly, just, for God's sake, if, if you want to help orphans, take all the money you lost there and go give it to orphans. Just do that. But you lost it to Las Vegas. And you got nothing out of it. And you had to catch a bus home instead of a plane. All right. And it's time to quit. Let me just see if I finish this statement here. My next sentence starts with, if this is the case, and I'm supposed to stop right here. All right, we're going to take, we're going to stop, and we'll come back momentarily.